Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 348 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. So thrilled that you are here with me today as I am talking to Helen Scheurer, who is a delight. We talk about mental health and headphones and Google Calendar. So stick around for that absolutely delightful interview coming up. Uh, what's going on around here? I got a door from my office. And the only reason I'm pointing it out is that if anyone's watching on YouTube, which most people don't, the vast, 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 vast majority of you listen in a podcast, fantastic. But uh, the only reason I'm bringing it up is because I can see it on my camera right now. And the door is so cool. So I told you, I have two offices, which is uh, honestly the best thing that's ever happened to me. I have the little antechamber. We're calling it the antechamber because I don't know what else to call it. It's the orange room with the yellow couch and the blue uh, carpet and the old furniture that I have been putting in there. It's very, it's wee, but it's got a little sofa bed and um, it's lovely. And then I have this sun porch, which I put down a beautiful little rug and it holds two desks and one desk I write at and do my journaling at. And this is the desk I sit at to do work, work and teach. But there was no door. There was no door between the two. And we had a friend come. I know I mentioned Fred come to stay with us from the States. She was here for uh, with us for about 10 days and she was staying in the antechamber. And right before she came, I'm like, you know, what's not going to work? A curtain, a curtain when I am talking on camera a lot, doing things like teaching, curtain's not gonna work. Um, so I went online and I found a place locally that does restores old recycled doors. And this is an old mahogany door from about the same vintage of the house, about a hundred years old. And for those of you who can't see it, it is dark wood, but the top half, it's really the top half. It's a thin door. It's narrow, um, but the top half is glass, super, super heavy glass. We have no glass like it in the rest of the house. And the uh, fellow who was putting it in pointed it out. This is really, really old glass. And I had fantasies about um, putting something silly on it. You know, Rachel Heron, private detective, and, you know, installing Venetian blinds because private detective's office, they all have broken Venetian blinds. Um, funny, haha. But what I have noticed is that it is also a reflection behind me and it's super windy today in Wellington. And when a Wellingtonian, uh, which is what I am now, says it's windy, oh man, is it windy. So you can kind of see behind me these huge palm fronds in the garden flapping up and down. And uh, so that's exciting. So if you hear roars behind me, that is, that's just the wind. What has been going on around here? Our friend was here. It was fantastic. She's also a writer, a screenwriter, and dear heart, dear friend. And I got to say, I cannot imagine anyone being a more appreciative um, viewer of a friend's new world than Megan. You know how when you're having a walk somewhere and you think to yourself, oh, wouldn't this person love that? Or wouldn't I love to show this to X, Y, or Z. And then they show up and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to take you to the place. And they go, oh, it's nice. And, you know, did you hear about the news last week? And that's what you get. Megan was everything. Wherever we took her, she would look out at the view and go, oh, oh, what's that? What is that doing? What do you like about this? What's this restaurant like? Why does the coffee taste like this? Look at your ceiling. How amazing. How do you think they did that? And 10 days of her appreciating anything that Lala and I pointed out to her. And Lala and I have been alone for three years and almost two years in New Zealand. And Lala and I have the same conversations all, all the time. Look at that. Isn't that cool? How do you think that works? Great. But we're the only ones talking about this. So Megan, you'll never hear this, but thank you for being the best audience for two people who just needed somebody else to talk to for a while. So that was great. Did I get a lot of work done? I did not. I did not get a lot of work done while she was here, which was great. I managed to keep up with my teaching obligations and that's all I needed to do. You know, that's not true because I was still writing those 500 words, not every day. My mantra for these 500 words is daily-ish. Uh, I like to think of daily-ish for many things because as soon as I lock into an unbroken chain of days where I have done an event, I can get super competitive 
And if I've got a hundred days of doing something, I want 101. And if I miss that 101st day and I've had a long string, I lose all motivation and I never go back to whatever it was I was doing. So it's almost better for me to break the chain once a week, once every two weeks. So I did not write every day that she was here, but 500 words is super sneaky, super awesome to just slip in to your world. And uh, it's been making me feel really good to do those 500, 600 playful words early in the morning. And then even on crabby days where I'm just like, what have I, what have I done? I've still got some boxes to unpack. I've still got this to do. I can think to myself, I, but I wrote, I wrote some new words and that's my job as a writer. And I've mentioned this before, but I might keep mentioning it because this 500 word thing is so, has been so awesome for me in that I can go months and months and months without writing new words. That is an overstatement. I'm always writing new words for things like essays and Patreon things and emails, but without writing words in a project, because I'm so busy in a project, revising it or revising it again, or revising a different project. So to continually be first drafting is a very good exercise for me, someone who doesn't love first drafting, but apparently I love it when it's, it's kind of aimless in the best way I can. I'm writing things that I don't know where they're going to fit. I'm writing for books that I don't know are going to go anywhere, but every day I have new words and it has been so joyful and generative for me that it is working as one of my uh, student and friends said, it's working for now. It's working for me for now. Things always change. That's why I have this podcast. I love to hear about how everyone writes and there is nothing there is nothing in the world that works for everyone. There is absolutely nothing in the world that works for everyone, but there are a lot of awesome best practices that we can try and make into our own best practices and best routine for now. If it works for now, that's all that matters. And that's what we're doing here. So those 500 words have been wonderful. And I did spend um, time after that this morning, kind of organizing this new memoir that I am playing with. I realized that I could easily write 500 words a day and never, I never get anywhere. Uh, so I did take a bit of, I took about an hour this morning to draft out some ideas for this memoir so that when I open the 500 word a day document, I can go look at that and say, oh, I think I'm going to write about that today. So that was also fun. I really feel like I'm slipping back into the work routine after months of chaos doing our big hike suddenly buying a house, suddenly packing everything, suddenly moving everything, suddenly unpacking everything. At this moment, Lala is literally in the dining room painting it blue, beautiful, beautiful blue. I can't describe it. It's light, but not too bright and not pale, not baby blue. It's, uh, this is why I don't, I am not an artist because I can't describe that blue, but it is, it's not sky. It's like deeper than sky blue. Mm, mm, it's going to be good. We like color around here. Uh, what else has been going on? I want to thank two new patrons. Hello, new patrons to Linda Moore, who I am about to record a uh, Q and a video for the patrons who are at the $5 a month level and up for whom I am their mini coach. And Linda Moore became a patron and jumped in with both feet and has some great questions coming. So for Linda Moore, I wish you the perfect sailing conditions, warm, clear skies, wind that is reliable and easy, and a sky full of constellations pointing to your true north. And for Sean McKinnon, welcome. I wish for you the perfect cup of hot cocoa that reminds you how lovely it is to be warm and dry, your eyelids drifting down, down, down while you read the best book that you've picked up in years and wish that you could keep reading it. But oh, you are so sleepy. Mm. I like to think of these wishes for you all. So thank you for that. And now let's get into this interview because it was awesome. I adore Helen. So here's a little bit of a bio for Helen. Helen Schreiber is the fantasy author of the best-selling trilogy, The Oromere Chronicles and The Curse of the Siren Queen Quartet. Her work has been highly praised for its strong, flawed female characters and its action-packed plots. 
She has also published advice for authors with her debut nonfiction book, How to Write a Successful Series. Helen holds a creative writing degree and a master's of publishing. She has all, she's been a full-time author since 2018 and now lives amidst the mountains in New Zealand where she is constantly dreaming up new stories. Please enjoy this interview with Helen. Please do your own work. Come find me. Tell me all about it. I love to hear about it. You can do this just a little bit at a time, gets it done. And here we go with the interview. All right. Well, I could not be more pleased that you are on the show with me today. Hello. Will you please share your name and pronouns with us? Yeah, absolutely. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Helen Scheurer and my pronouns are she, her. I am thrilled to have you. I'm so glad that you reached out. And I, we were just chatting this off air, um, that I've heard you making the rounds and your book was already in my must buy list. And I can't wait to talk to you about it because I have some questions for you specifically about series. And I know you're going to be able to um, help me out with that. But before we get into that, let's talk about your process a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, You have been doing this a while and you've been doing it remarkably successfully since about 2017. (laughs) Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. have had some good um, success from readers and financial and all that fun stuff. So will you please tell us how you get your writing done? What is your process actually for writing? Sure. So um, I've been doing this uh, full time for about nearly five years now. Um, So I do have the whole day at my disposal and I work five days a week. Um, So when I'm um, actually writing and not either in editing mode or marketing mode, uh, it's the first thing I do um, every morning. Um, I'm an outliner, so I try to have a decent outline to sort of reference as I'm working because I tend to stall if I don't know where I'm going. Mm, mm-hmm. um, and I've found like that's something that's I've developed over the last couple of years and my process has, has been refined over that time. It wasn't always that um, sort of smooth, I guess. Um, but, yeah, I, I outline and um, I pretty much when I'm writing, I spend the whole day writing. Um, I, my wow. number one strength is focus. So I, I just, oh. everything else just disappears. Um, <laughs> my yeah, focus so. is, is pretty far down there. I don't have a lot of focus. So yeah. <laughs> Plus ADHD is just, you know, fractured. Right. So I yeah. love hearing that, that people can actually go to the desk and stay there for hours and hours and hours. That must yeah, feel I've good. Actually, like, you can see the tea station behind me I've um, set up like a little tea corner in my office so I don't even need to leave the office when I'm writing I just sort of swivel on my chair deal with it and um, because I found I started off um, sprinting and just because it's what everybody says to do and um, I spoke to a coach and she's like why are you sprinting you're breaking your number one strength and as soon as she told me that She basically gave me permission to do what came really naturally, which was just Mm. to sit and forget about everything else and just write. And um, yeah, so that's, that's how I do it now. Um, And I try and make sure that whether I'm writing or editing, I always try and prioritize production at the beginning of the day. So that's, you know, before I check emails, before I go on social media, all of that sort of stuff, I have to either get words written or I have to, edit the words and it's, it's about the product and producing that product the, the first half of the day at least. Um, so yeah, that's, that's generally sort of my, my process at the moment. And um, for people listening, I am looking behind you and there's a fantastic, <laughs> what the heck is, can you describe that for listeners? What is going on on the, it's an office max kind of wall thing, but is it a calendar? I can't quite tell. Yeah. Yeah. It's a calendar. So the, the one with all the mess on it, that's yeah. this year's. And then the one um, without as much much stuff is next year's. Um, and that's just uh, me plotting out where I think my releases are going to go and then building around that. Like I find it um, quite helpful to look at production from sort of a, a bird's eye point of view. Wow. Um, so yeah, so is that 12 vertical columns as in months and then have you yourself colored it in so maybe white is work days and that peach is when no, weekend that, or something like that or is that how it comes that's that's how it comes um and that doesn't apply to me anyway because I um I set my days to my partner's days so mm. we um we have generally Wednesday Thursdays off so not a normal working week um right. so that's kind of useless to me with the the color coding but it, it's fine for for the moment <laughs> but I kind of love this idea of being able to look at not only the year you're in with a vertical line for the month, I, you know, I'm always so attracted to new process and 
productivity hacks, mm. but also the next year and what those months might, I might, I might make one for myself that way. That, that looks really cool. Yeah, I, they're, they're good. I and like they're it. actually um, like whiteboard uh, sort of style. So you can write on them with a whiteboard marker and you can rub it off if you need to, um, which is good for when things are, you know, you're wanting to move things around, around or experiment with how you're structuring things. Um, so yeah, they're, they're quite handy. I think they're only about $12 from Office Max here in New Zealand. So it's not too bad. Excellent. And you're in Queenstown, right? Yes. 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 We were there. We were there in December and it was beautiful. It's gorgeous. It was gorgeous. It is gorgeous. Um, it's a bit cold though. <laughs> how long have you been there? Um, since 2019, I moved here from Sydney. So change from Sydney to, to Queenstown, but huge yeah, change. So. Sydney is such an enormous city and Queenstown is so small and cute tiny, tiny and, town. <laughs> and cold. I'm sure in winter, I cannot even imagine Very what it cold. is like, but we're going yeah. into spring now. And that's low. I've got the, um, I've got lilacs that have just bloomed on the hill behind me. So I'm excited oh, about nice. that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what is your biggest challenge when it comes to writing? Um, so that's a really revolution, I guess, for me at the moment, because I'm sort of coming out of this at the moment. Um, and I've realized that in my process, the drafting I find for the most part very fun. Um, it's when, you know, you're writing a draft for yourself and you get to be creative and you're not necessarily in a critical mindset as such. Like you, you have always have the voice in the back of your head. But for me, as I'm writing, I keep a list of the things that I think I'm going to need to fix when it comes to the editing. Mm -hmm. And so when I finish the draft, I basically have a list ready to go. And I find that that critical mindset is quite um, overwhelming at times. Mm. Like, so I do, I draft, I do a structural edit myself um, based on all the things that I've written down. Then I do like a read through, then it goes to betas, then it gets revised. And then I might do that process again so two rounds of beta reading um, and that's before editor proofreader all that sort of stuff but I've definitely found lately that I have a tendency when I'm really in the deep end of the structural editing the tendency to sort of spiral into negative thinking and having this sort of really harsh talk with myself about what needs fixing if I could even fix it blah 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 um, and I've recently just done, or I'm about to do a second. So back to back, the way my projects have worked out has been, I've just finished a structural edit, which was very intense. Um, and it was also on my biggest book that I've written so far. It was mm. 130,000 words, which oh my God. that was quite, it's my biggest one. Um, and that was, I found that really, really challenging. And then I'm going into a structural edit of another one. So I'm, I've not really had much of a break between the two very intense like critical mindsets that you've got to be in so I find it hard to pull myself out of that sort of negative self-talk um when when I'm doing that I'm trying to be better um just this week I gave myself a week in between the previous edit and the one that I'm going to start tomorrow and that was to focus on marketing and admin and I think that was probably one of the best things that I've done because I knew I was going to be in this mindset. So I needed to have a, a, a week where I could, you know, try to be creative with marketing and, and things like that before sort of knuckling down back into this kind of intense uh, mindset, if that makes sense. Yeah. And there's something, there's something really good about knowing that about yourself too. I tend to, I'm the absolute opposite. I beat myself up and hate myself and hate my process and hate my books when I'm in the first draft. I just am a terrible writer. Nothing is enjoyable um, until I get to the editing phase. But just knowing that my brain will tell me that and it's a lie um, almost feels sometimes like, and I hate to say this, but like how PMS is sometimes, you know, like when, mm. when, when you, yep. when you realize it doesn't help me feel any better, but at least I'm not beating myself up. I know that it's something outside yeah. myself. This always happens. I'm going to feel better when this is done, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've, I love that comparison because that's exactly right. Like you, I think while you're right, it doesn't help in any way, but just being able to identify what's causing it 
helps in its in a different way, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I, and you I don't have to that. buy in, you don't have to buy into that belief that I'm not a bad writer. This is just the way I always feel. This is part of my process. And I need to be really, really nice to myself. And I need to mm-hmm. take that week to have time up. And I need to spend more time with my partner on the couch and cuddling whatever yeah. animals happen to walk by. <laughs> so what is your biggest joy when it comes to writing? Um Biggest joy, I think, is when something like clicks into place, particularly for me writing these big, sprawling, epic fantasy series. A lot of the time I'll make certain choices, I suppose, while I'm drafting, but then I don't really realise what they're for until later. Mm -hmm. And it might be like two books in, I'm like, oh, that's why I did that. And it falls into place and it all, like when all the threads get pulled together and that sort of joy, I really like that moment pretty much um and then one that I've also been enjoying lately is I've I've just finished um my second epic fantasy series and the last book was quite an emotional one and some of the messages that I've been getting from readers have been really really lovely Um, so that that's always nice knowing that that your work resonated with someone that you know it helped them out of a tough spot or you know it helped them escape for a little bit Um, so yeah, I've, re- I've really got a lot of joy out of those messages lately, especially because I got them while I was in the middle of all this other um, right. editing stuff. So, yeah, like every now and then I'll be having a really horrible day, you know, trying to work out some plot hole that, you know, it seems impossible. And then I'll get a message telling me that this book mattered to someone and it's a bit of a boost when when you need it. <laughs> that is gorgeous. That is gorgeous. How do you, how do you manage... Um, holding all of the stuff in the series in your head or do you not do you have an external place where you put all that information I use a series bible um so I've got the memory of a goldfish um (laughs) so (laughs) I would just I I use an outline um for when I'm writing and I also it's a it's just a spreadsheet and I'll have different sheets within that sheet so that if I get an idea for a later book it goes yeah. into that particular book's um, thing. So then yeah. um, where I'm, I'm about to start outlining a second book in another series and I've already got an almost populated spreadsheet from ideas that I got when I was writing the first one, wow. whereas I wouldn't remember any of that. Um, so I use that and then I use a series Bible. But I suppose the series Bible, and I talk about this in, in the nonfiction book, is sort of, it's more like a working document so I'll be writing and I'll have it up on the other screen and anytime I make a decision that I know I'm going to need to remember whether it's someone's eye color or it's the name of a place or it's a particular detail that just goes in the series bible as I'm writing so it's not like this huge task where I sit down before I write the book and I have to write a series bible it's just it just sort of grows with the series yeah um so that's that's how I sort of with the the outline and the series Bible combined is how I sort of um, manage all the stuff that floats around in your head. I really like that idea of having the the additional pages for each book and you're already working inside those. I feel a series might be coming my way and I'm regretting already not doing that for the second book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's tough to keep it all um, making sense in your head. Um, I, I, if I can get it out on the page or out on the screen, that's what I'll do. Yeah. I just not great at remembering anything. (laughs) Yeah. I've had a couple series, I guess three series Bibles for the three different series I've done. Maybe I've done four series and I didn't do a Bible for one, but it's so messy. Um, is yours actually like organized mine or like I'll have like three storefront names and then four brothers who walk by and, and do you actually have it? Do you have it in, in pieces in there? I, yeah. I, I, I try. So the reason I started doing it was because I didn't do it for my first series and that became a massive headache later on trying to remember details. And now like I've, I've had this thought that, you know, one day in the future, because all my series are set in the same universe Mm-hmm. And there's potential for one day in the future to bring protagonists from each of them into sort of like a Avengers style yeah. reunion. Um, but I don't have a series Bible for that first one. And so that would involve, and that's three, three books that are over a hundred thousand words each that are epic fantasies, multiple points of view. And the thought of dealing with that 
does oh, not bring me joy. <laughs> do not, do not even handle that. That is when you will hire someone to write the series Bible for I you. Hope, I hope, I hope so. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's but, not but, worth it <laughs> otherwise. Yeah. But they are the, the one that I did for Curse and Siren Queen, which is my second series. Um, it's just a Google document, but I've used um, subheadings and I've tried to make it mm. as like easily searchable as possible. So if mm-hmm. I can't remember, you know, what someone looks like, control find that character's name. If I can't remember what spelling I went for for this particular place, I control find. Um, and that that makes it much, much easier. And, you know, it's, it's broken down into things like setting, characters, magic rules. Um, mm. You know, I've, then I've just got a list of, the entire cast and then what book each person was introduced because you you might have characters that Ooh, don't come into it that's three smart. or four yeah because then you know timeline wise I'm terrible I'm terrible with numbers all that sort of stuff so yeah I I, I don't want to in book three make a reference to a character that has only been there for one book instead of two blah 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 so yeah I, I try it's, it's always a work in progress and I yeah. try and refine it as I go the, the series Bible that I currently have for the new series is a mess. I think as they get bigger, I organize them a bit better. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas the current one is just like an info dump of, um, of stuff that needs uh, organizing. Yeah. But the, the previous previous one is, um, is, a, is a good start, I think. Yeah. It's kind of the, where does the panic level lie? Like I can, I can deal with my office being a mess for a while. And then once the panic sets in, I need to get it organized. And I can imagine it's the same way with something like that. Yeah. I feel like you're already giving us a ton of tips. Oh, go on. (laughs) Oh, I was just going to say that the, the series Bible for Curse of the Siren Queen, it's about 65 pages long now. Holy crap. Yeah. So if it's not organized, that's the problem. Whereas my current one, I think, because it's I've only written one book in that series so far, it's maybe 20, 25 pages. But it includes things like maps, um, you know, char- like what characters look like or if there's a particular setting that I want to remember for reference later, I'll put a picture in or something like that. So it's not just a huge chunk of text, but yeah. they, they do, they do kind of get quite big. <laughs> that is so, I, that is... I love that. I, I love that idea of that organization. Can can you share a craft tip of any sort with us? I feel like you've already given us several, but. <laughs> well, it's, it's probably just because I've recently done this, but what I was saying before about taking the break in between the mm-hmm. edits, mm-hmm. for me, I think like while it's not specifically about writing, I think mental health wise and writing, taking that, and it wasn't like I took a week off work, but I allowed myself a week to focus on things that generally I just try and fit in at the end of the day. So like yeah. social media or a launch plan or getting back to people on emails. Um, and because, because my number one strength is focus, an hour at the end of the day is not really enough for me. I don't, I don't tend to sink into anything unless I've been doing it for like a couple of hours. And so this past week was really good because it gave me that breather in between projects that I stopped feeling so shit about myself. And then I also had a week for the first time in five years to focus on being in marketing and all the, all the things that I've wanted to do for a long time, but you know, they get put on the back burner because creating a logo for a fictional pub in an epic fantasy book is probably not the best use of my time, but um <laughs> So I, I got to do things like that and I got to actually sit and think about how I wanted to launch next year's book, which is why I've got the 2023 up there with all the post-it notes on it already. Um, and I also got to rejig my entire sort of production marketing system. Like I had originally, I had a spreadsheet for social media, a spreadsheet for newsletter planning. I had a Google calendar. I had everything under the sun. I had, and it was just, it got like you were saying about your office, it got to a point where it was just too much going on. And so yeah. that week allowed me the sort of brain space to rejig everything and pull it all into one system that, that worked for me. So I suppose in a very long winded answer to your question, I suppose finding out the things that work best for you is a huge tip that I would I wish people had have said that to me sooner. <laughs> can you, because I'm a big nerd, can you tell us about 
how you pulled those, um, those disparate systems together. What did, what did you pull them into? Please tell me. <laughs> what did you combine um, it's, it's them nothing, into? Nothing very complicated. So I was already using Google Calendar and actually Sasha told me, she reminded me that you can hide calendars within it. So I've got- Oh, good point. Um, I'm always hiding my wife's calendar because it annoys me. I never considered <laughs> doing that for my own calendars. Oh my God, yeah, my brain just exploded. So, exactly. And that's what happened with me. So um, I oh. then created a calendar for, so I already had book production in there, but I've got personal book production, social media, newsletters, ARC campaigns. Um, what else do I have? Outreach marketing, um, there's like 10 different calendars. And mm -hmm. so when, when I want to look at something, I can hide a bunch of them. I can have them all mm -hmm. there so I can see how chaotic everything is. Um, and, you know, you have the functionality, for example, um, with my newsletter, I plan that in advance. So it comes out maybe twice a month and already from now until I think February where I'm planning to launch another book. I've got those planned out and it has a functionality where you can add descriptions, add links, add um, pictures, whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. And you basically, I sat down the other day to write a newsletter, opened the calendar and all the newsletter content was there in dot points that I've done however long ago. And it just takes a lot of the decision fatigue away. And it's, I, I'm a big nerd for stuff like this as well. So I loved just having it finally all in the one place because I was forgetting to check you know, that spreadsheet that I created over here, yes. I started something over here. I've exactly. got, you know, on my walls, I've got lists coming out of everywhere. Like, so it, it was really good to just bring it all to that one place and, and lose some of that chaos. Um, because I love so yeah, Trello. I, mean, I don't yeah, know if you've ever, used, if you've ever used Trello, but, think, but then I, I forget I to go to, there. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. but if it's all in the Google calendar, because Trello you, is that for me, you know, you can put checklists and all your, all your ideas and stuff in that, but I, I didn't even ever consider doing that right inside Google calendar. Jay, Jay Thorne used to yeah. tell me to do this and I forgot again. That's well, so I smart. Also, like love about it is that you can create reoccurring right. duplicate tasks. So um, I know, for example, that every 31st of January, that's my um, full-time author anniversary. Mm. And every 31st of January, I post on social media about it being, you know, five years, six years, whatever. And so that's a post I do every year. So that got a repeat annual task. Mm -hmm. um, I've got other anniversaries and things for my career, like book birthdays. You know, it's it, this, this year, it was the fifth birthday of my first book. Um, so I had a reminder come up for that and, you know, there's, just, and there's content. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, we have to hang up right now because I need to go look at my go -Kart calendar. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's gorgeous. That's okay. Great. I mean, so, it's, it's partly Sasha's, uh, Sasha's suggestion. Too, so I love it that we, give that we keep like this. We'll always suggest things to each other, all of us, all the time, and only at the perfect time it will appear as the perfect thing for us to do, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I would love to ask you, what is, what is the most mortifying moment you have survived as a writer? <laughs> so I only remembered this when I read this question. I put it away in my embarrassing folder it. and just I blocked it, compartmentalized the shit out of it. But uh, there was uh, must have been like six years ago or something like that. I did a master's of publishing um, degree at the University of Sydney, and they used to host these networking events um, at like a fancy bar in Sydney, and it was just a, a big like piss up. But I. I think I was running late or something and I ended up falling down the stairs in front of everybody. Oh. So, <laughs> oh, no. Like that was, and that was in front of all the editors and publishers and all the people that I was trying to impress. <laughs> so yeah, I'd totally forgotten about that until I read, read that question. So it's not really writing related, but it was sort of in the industry and all my writer friends saw it. It was just a bit, it was a bit embarrassing. <laughs> oh, that's good. But you, you know, you left an indelible impression in their minds for, yeah. for better. Or I, mean, I, don't, I don't think I went back. I don't think I went back to one after that, to be fair. It was all, um, it was all traditional publishing as well. Yeah. So it was kind of like a stuffy, yeah. stuffy event. Um, you yeah. showed yourself out. <laughs> 
Yeah, I did. I did, and I did not go back. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with me. Oh my god! Right. I'm going to try and, then, and not remember that for another five years. <laughs> you won't. You won't. Your brain is just going to put that right on lockdown. That's what mine does I for my so. embarrassing stuff, so, which is why I love to ask this. What well, is? What, and what's these yours? Are, this, you know, what is my most embarrassing, mortifying moment? I have survived as a writer. Um, I was in, I was in a cab with Ann Perry after a conference and I started to reference uh, the murder that she committed in Christchurch. Um, The, you know, the uh, beautiful creatures. Um, She was one of the girls who murdered their mother. And then um, she was shipped out of New Zealand. um, And my mother was in New Zealand at the time. And I stopped myself, but I know that she knew that I was about to say it. And I still like, I'm blushing even to think about it. And I, it is Ann Perry, right? I need to, I need to Google it. I'm not making, I'm going to hear clicking. I'm not sure. Uh, da, da, da. Yes. At the age of 15, she and her best friend, Pauline Parker were convicted of the murder of Parker's mother. And then um, uh, Kate Winslet played one of them in, in the movie, but yeah, she went on to then to become this m- murder mystery writer in Britain who apparently blocked it out of her own mind, blocked the murder out of her own mind and didn't, she said God. it didn't come back to her until she was on national television being interviewed. And yeah, I almost, I almost said something about her being a killer while riding in the cab oh, going to the airport. <laughs> in Vancouver. Yeah. I can't even talk about okay. it. <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> no worries. More, I thought more, I'm going right here. I may as well make you suffer as thank well. You. <laughs> thank you. I'm sure if somebody ever asked me about that again, like what's your most morning, I'm sure I could come up with more too. Um, oh, all right. <laughs> so what, what is the kindest thing that anyone has ever done for you in your writing career? Um, I think uh, it's probably Sasha. She, oh. I reached out to her, yeah, beginning of 2021. I didn't have, I wasn't very entrenched in like the, the author community. I didn't have regular like ongoing friendships with any other indie authors, which is pretty isolating. Like this job is quite yeah. lonely at times anyway. And then to not have anybody to talk to who understands what's going on was quite, quite challenging. Um, so I started talking to her and we hit it off right away. And she has just been one of the kindest people in terms of not only incredible support, incredible friend, but she's so generous with connecting you to other people. So mm. she introduced me to a lot of other people who I'm now really good friends with as well. And so she kind of single-handedly stopped my isolation. <laughs> I've not I actually said that, that. <laughs> But yeah, so that was, that was a really amazing kindness of her. And she, she continues to do stuff like that. So yeah, very, very generous just with her knowledge and her friends and, and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, very grateful for that. Mm-hmm. And if anyone is listening to this for the first time, we are talking about Sasha Black, who runs the Rebel Author Podcast, which is a fantastic podcast. And once a month, um, I talk to her on the Black Heron, which is, which is super fun. Um, at, how are you at all involved in RWNZ, Romance Writers of New Zealand? No, no, I'm not. A, um, because pretty, I, I only great. I Even if you don't write just, romance, you, you right, know. Okay, I thought I yeah. thought you had to write romance. No, um, no, no. As but, long as you've ever had a kiss in one of your books, there you go. You're in. Oh, people right, people okay. write all sorts of stuff, but the, it's just a really great group of people who really understand the publishing industry. So. Oh, cool. And I bet yeah, there's well, a local actually, chapter. Oh, I hope so, because um, you do sort of miss the the face to face contact yeah. a little bit. Um, but I'm actually just going into romantic fantasy now. Um, I haven't my my debut into that is coming out in February, so oh, um, yes. that will be my first first foray into romance, which I'm pretty excited about. Yes. Look, look up the, look up if you have a local chapter, I bet you do. And then um, I don't know where the national is next year, but it was pretty great. It was a great conference and it was really oh, nice maybe. to see writers in person again. Yes. So speaking of kind things, what is the kindest thing that you've ever done for yourself as a writer? <laughs> um, I think the last thing it's, it's all sort of self self care stuff. Cause I'm not really great yeah. at that. Um, so the last time I finished a draft, I went and took myself to get a massage. Mm. Um, 
because I tend to like sit here really tense and like by the end of, um, you know, a hundred thousand word draft, I'm in agony. <laughs> um, so I went and took myself for a massage, which felt like quite an indulgent thing to do. You know, they're not cheap, but I was like, I earned this. Um, and so I, I did that. And then um, more recently, we've, we've had a lot of construction around our um, building. And for the longest time, like it seems to just follow me every time I move apartments, there's just new construction going on. Um, and so last week or the week before, I invested in a pair of um, noise cancelling headphones. Best and I spent, thing ever. Yeah, I spent probably what was about a week's worth of rent on these headphones. So it was definitely not cheap. And I was having this sort of tug of war of guilt with myself of, like, do you really need these? And they have just made life so much better. I didn't. I always suspected I might have a bit of like sensory issue mm -hmm. overload with lots of noise and things. Um, and then that obviously interferes with number one focus. Um, and these headphones have just like, I put them on and I just go in the zone yes. and all that sort of stress and tension that seems to build up when there is so much stuff going on around me just sort of ebbs away. Um, so those two things, um, that's that's been me being kind to myself essentially spending money on myself when there normally I probably such wouldn't good good methods of spending money on yourself such good mm. and the and the headphones are you know a tax write-off too <laughs> I got my I didn't I didn't want to get these um airpods I, I I don't even have an iPhone uh but when we moved here I was constantly working like right next to my wife like in you know Airbnbs and stuff and I finally got them mm -hmm. and one of them broke recently it was still under warranty and I had to go without them for a week and I almost died it's just to yeah. be able to turn the noise canceling on and have the world soften and just have you yes. be able to be in your head. It's so, if anyone is thinking about spending the money, if you should just yes, do it. Yes, highly recommend. Yeah. I, I mean, I put it off for about a year and I yeah. regret doing that um, because it does, it feels like a big luxury. It feels like a big expense. And I mean, it, it is for yeah. a lot of people. But if you, if you can, especially if you suffer from, you know, sensory stuff and because mm -hmm. I feel it like bodily if, if things mm -hmm. are going on around me I hold that stress in my yeah. chest yes and I put those headphones on and it is just like a sigh of relief um so yeah I absolutely agree if, if you if you feel like you might need them they're an incredible investment yes and and it's okay for us to spend money on ourselves I am incredibly cheap when it comes mm -hmm. to myself I refuse to buy anything expensive for myself anybody else whatever you yeah. want, let's do it. But for <laughs> yeah. me, yeah. So oh, I, I hope that this encourages one person to do it. All right. Yeah, so let's talk books for a moment. What's the best book that you've read recently and why did you love it? So I really like this question because it wasn't the answer that I thought. Um, mm. And so this book, I'm really behind the times. This is probably a really old book now, but it's called The Dip by Seth Godin. Oh, Seth Godin. Goodwin. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was basically talking to a couple of author friends and we were talking about, um, you know, how sales have dipped and how everything just feels so much harder and you're working harder for less, um, less sales, less this. It's just everything has felt like you're sort of clawing your way through at the moment. At least that's how it's been mm -hmm. for me. And um, I mentioned it to um, a couple of people and they were like, have you read The Dip? And I was like, no, I have no idea. I in my own little bubble, I don't know anything, um, but I read it. And while it wasn't like, it's not something that, you know, I'm going to be quoting or anything like that. There was this graphic in it that demonstrates the, have you, have you read it? Uh, I can't, I've read so many of his books and I, I know the concept of the dip though. Will you talk us through it? Okay. Uh, so yeah, my, my understanding of, of, a, of this graphic, which is the, the concept of the book is that when you start a new skill, a new career, new whatever. Um, at the beginning, it all feels great and you feel like you're, you're going up, everything's on the up, you know, it's all new, it's exciting, you've got the energy, the drive for it. And it gets to this point where then there's a dip because things get hard. And it's in the dip where a lot of people quit, a lot of people give up. I'd say um, most people but, quit. Yeah, yeah. And, and in order to get but in, in order to become like a master of this skill or to level up in your career, you have to go through the dip because that's the stuff that makes you a master of what you're going to be 
And that all that effort that you go through while you're in the dip then compounds for when you're on the rise again. And I had this really strange experience where i have been talking about it without actually having read the book and everyone's like, that's the dip, that's the dip. <laughs> and so I, I read it and I, I got that graphic up on my computer and then I got my all-time sales data up on the computer and it was honestly the exact same um, like curvature line as the dip. And I was like, oh my God, this, this is it. This is what this is. is. wild. Yeah. And it, it was just, um, I guess, cause I, I have been, I think since 2020, really, I've been struggling because I do this full time. It's, it's a lot of pressure to put on just, and I it's mainly book sales. It's yeah. Mm-hmm. I'd say 90, 98% book sales. Um, and yeah, I, it's been, it's been a real struggle and then putting the two things side by side and literally it was like someone had just patted me on the head and gone it's going to be okay look it's going to be okay I um adore so, that yeah so it, it wasn't like you know it, life-changing literature as such but it just gave me such comfort and such reassurance that everything that I've been doing for the last couple of years when it has been really hard it's it's paying off and it will pay off and it it is on the on the up yes, and let's hope yes. it's not a fluke it's it's going to carry on going up like yeah. the dip says <laughs> so I, I have yeah. a, I have a corollary belief to that that I don't remember because I know I read the book but his books kind of blur into each other for me but I am really still enjoying the practice which I have not made my way through yet I read them in small bits because they're such small bite-sized pieces um mm-hmm. but I also believe that after the dip I like to call it the surge like yeah <sighs> And I, and I talk about it with my students, like, you know, when right before a tsunami and the tide goes out, cause it's getting sucked mm-hmm. out, that's the dip. And then the tsunami pushes you back up that surge. Oh, so that that. If you're in the dip, you can either let go and give up and, and, or you hang on and you come back up in the surge. And unfortunately, when we're talking mm-hmm. about writing books, when we're actually talking about being inside the production of a book, the dips come and the surges come and the dips come and the surges come. But I always think that the, that the, the bigger the dip that we're in, the bigger the surge will be if we can just, Mm. um, which also comforts me. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. I love that so much. Okay. Let's, uh, speaking of books, can you please tell us about your recent nonfiction release, which I will, I, in, in the interest of full disclosure earlier this week, I was like, I should go get the e-arc that she sent me. But then I thought, no, I want to actually buy this book and read it because um, I may have another series coming up in my life. I'm not sure yet. And, um, and so tell us about that, please. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I would say that I always take more inf- information in when I read a book, a nonfiction book in print, and then you can make notes and all yeah. that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so how to write a successful series is it pretty much does what it says on the label, um, but it uses a lot of my personal experiences from when I wrote my first series, which was quite quite successful. I didn't really realise it at the time, um, and it's really only been in the last couple of years that I've understood just how um, unusual that was. Um, so, yeah, it sort of goes through everything from planning and outlining if that's what you do. Um, It's got a chapter for discovery writers. I interviewed two discovery writers just to get the other side of the the coin. Um, And it talks about series Bibles. It talks about all the different elements that a successful series needs like breadcrumbs, open loops. Um, Do you use hard cliffhangers or soft cliffhangers? Um, And it also talks about literary universes and setting multiple series in the same universe and how you can leverage that for long-term success. And I think the the main sort of point of the whole thing is utilizing series for long-term success. So series, it's, and I've never rapid released. So my first series, I had one book come out a year and then my most recent series, I think I had two books out a year. Oh, that um, makes so me feel better because there's still that, you know, that myth that goes around that if you're not releasing a book every three weeks, you're a failure. Yeah, you know? I, I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't do that. Yeah, um, so it. yeah, just to, just to clarify, it's not just for people who are going to be um, rapid releasing. Um, and it also talks about what you can sort of do in between releases, like how you can use reader magnets to 
maintain interest in your series and how to sort of pull people from one series to a new series, um, all that sort of stuff. So I think it's quite an extensive um, look at all the things that you can do within a series to sort of set yourself up for the best chance of, of success. Um, at least I hope that's what it does. <laughs> that is so great. I cannot wait to read it. I cannot wait to read it. Thank you oh, thank so, you. so very much for being on the show. Can you please tell readers where we can find you out there? Yeah, absolutely. So you can go to helenshoira.com forward slash for authors. And that actually has a um, successful series bundle that you can download um, you actually get a copy of my Curse of Siren Queen series Bible as like an example of oh, what very you can do. Cool. Yeah, and it's got like a cheat sheet and all that sort of stuff. So if, if you're interested in the series stuff, that's yeah. where I would go. Um, if you're interested in epic fantasy fiction, then there's other pages on my website for that. But also I'm probably most active on, um, on Instagram and via my newsletter. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. This was awesome. Oh, no worries at all. Thank you for having me.